Thank you. Um, uh, anyone want that paper here? As well as it printed off some of the past CDR feedback. Can you want to uh, look at that picture of doing the same thing? Thank you. There's also a book that links to it in some way. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Dr. Pistol and audience for coming out to our critical design review uh, practice presentation. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, the QSET design team has been participating in the CSD CSDC uh, design challenge, um, which is a, operates under a two year design cycle in which we're tasked and provided uh, a mission in which and then we build uh, a three U CubeSat to fulfill this uh, this mission. And so my name is Sean and I'll be one of your presenters. I'm joined by my teammate and friends, uh, Aiden and Jacob, who will be also presenting. So what our agenda looks like today is we have uh, six main areas of discussion and then we'll conclude with uh, just a brief summary and then address any uh, questions and, and comments at the end. Um, yeah. So to start things off with our, our mission overview, uh, we're going to start with our uh, primary mission statement, uh, which is to provide point and shoot image capturing uh, capabilities from space for amateur radio operators uh, globally in near real time. And to satisfy this mission, we have the uh, selfie cam Earth observation imager as our payload. As our secondary mission uh, mission statements, uh, we want to demonstrate the uh, feasibility of custom made satellite bus uh, subsystems. And currently, uh, the team is uh, developing strategies to uh, utilize this self cam Earth observation imager. Um, to align it with sustainable development goals proposed by uh, the United Nations. So providing uh, an overview of the spacecraft system, uh, I just wanted to highlight some of the uh, key external features on board our satellite. Uh, most notable is the antenna deployment system, as well as the dual dipole antennas used for communication, as well as the uh, debug and control interface. Uh, exposed on uh, X uh, base of the satellite uh, used for our onboard uh, computer, as well as the sun sensors used for our attitude determination, uh, the solar arrays for our electrical power system, and then the selfie cam imager as seen on the positive Z uh, base. Uh, so to start off with, um, we've modeled uh, our orbit. Um, we've we're provided uh, two orbits um, from the, the CSDC uh, to model and to determine worst case analysis from. Uh, our first orbit is a sun synchronous orbit at 600 kilometers, uh, in which we uh, provided the ground track um, on Earth as seen with the, the blue uh, dash lights. And then using uh, an 80 degree uh, half cone, we uh, determine access times between a ground station located in Kingston uh, and the passing satellite, and that's seen with the, the white solid lines. Um, the second orbit that we performed our modeling was with uh, the same orbit as the ISS or International Space Station, um, which has a nominal attitude of 400 kilometers. And that's seen with the uh, the blue dash line again. Uh, and using the the same 80 degree half cone um, located in Kingston, uh, we modeled the access times in which a ground station would have access to our satellite, uh, as seen with the the white solid lines. And uh, just highlighting the the main uh, difference between these two orbits, uh, we see that uh, the orbit with the ISS has uh, plateaued. Uh, ground tracks, um, and that's just due to the the lower inclination of the ISS orbit as compared to the uh, the sun sink, and this can be summarized uh, in the following table, and uh, providing uh, four uh, number of passes a day for the sun synchronous, and then five for the worst case 
uh, minimum, minimum number of passes per day for the International uh, Space Station orbit. What this relates to is uh, our daily minimum contact time in which we uh, use to uh, calculate our telemetry and our throughput budget uh, for our communication system. So for the sun synchronous, uh, we have about 20 minutes for a daily minimum contact time. And for the International Space Station, we have just over, over 30 minutes of contact time. So going a bit more in depth on uh, the uh, hardware involved in the spacecraft, uh, we performed uh, a trait uh, selection on all the hardware uh, involved. And we uh, did this trait selection on a build versus buy uh, decision. And as you can see, uh, the majority of our, our principal components fall into uh, the build category. And so I'm just going to talk a bit, uh, a bit more about each one of the subsystems and what they're building and what they're buying. Uh, so for our payload, um, there is a, a large interest on the team regarding optics. Um, so we have opted to uh, build this optical system in-house um, and to mate with a chosen uh, camera sensor. Uh, and for this camera sensor, uh, this is uh, something to be purchased by the team, uh, and that's just so we have more bandwidth um, to put towards developing the optical system. Uh, regarding our mechanical subsystem, uh, the team previously has machined uh, a chassis that was used in a previous competition. However, due to, to warping and incorrect uh, dimensions, uh, an iterated version is being developed. Uh, and fortunately, here at Queen's, we do have access to uh, precision uh, machine shops. And so all components for our chassis um, will be built in-house. Uh, moving on to our EPS system. So the team has previously purchased uh, an EPS module, um, which satisfies both the power conditioning and power distribution requirements of the satellite. And we found that designing and building, uh, as well as testing a similar module would take bandwidth away from other required projects. So the team has decided to uh, put their focus into building uh, the accompanying uh, systems, including a battery board and solar panels. And uh, we've recognized that the complexity level of these products uh, allow them uh, allow for the team to make significant progress throughout the year. Moving on to ADCS, uh, the team previously has purchased uh, reaction wheels um, from a company called Maxon and their uh, accompanying uh, motor controllers, which satisfy the attitude control requirements of the satellite. So we will be continuing to use those. Uh, and that allows us to uh, put more attention into developing our own in-house magnet torquers, um, which we've seen to be feasible from other university design teams. Uh, moving on to our communication system. Um, this entire system will be built in-house. Um, there is enough knowledge on the team and enough interest uh, to support this project being built. Uh, as well, uh, there are RF testing facilities here, on, uh, here at Queen's, and so we'll be leveraging uh, these facilities um, going forward with this, with this development. Uh, lastly, for our, our trade selection uh, regards the, the OBC, uh, the team has opted to buy a, a Raspberry Pi 4 for the main processing unit. Um, we found that this has a, a lower barrier to entry than other microprocessors. Additionally, it does have flight heritage on a project called the Artemis CubeSat kit, and uh, it is shown to uh, operate under relatively large amounts of uh, radiation uh, called TID. Additionally, to, to accompany uh, our our button microprocessor, uh, the team is developing uh, a daughter board to mate with it to provide uh, interfacing and extend the features of this microprocessor. So putting that together, uh, we can see uh, the the physical layout and the physical stack up of our, our satellite. And we've taken two solar panels away just for easier viewing. Um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the, 
the layout of each of the, the principal features. So we can see the, the EPS with uh, the battery board and module just underneath. Uh, the ADCS with the reaction wheel, uh, the magnet torquers, and then the control board as well. Uh, the communication system with the antenna deployment system just below it. The onboard computer with the Raspberry Pi and daughter board just, as, uh, just below it as well. And then the uh, payload with the uh, accompanying camera and then the baffle to support the, the lens and the optics. And putting it back together, uh, I just want to highlight some important features of the enclosed system. Most noticeably that uh, axis or the orientation that we're using. So using the positive Z axis um, in line with the, uh, the imager, the positive X axis in line with the direction of movement and the Y axis completing that right hand rule. And this is a uh, just satisfies the requirement uh, as given by the CSDC. And then our modeling uh, shows that uh, all components do uh, fit within our uh, chief sat, um, size constraints as well. So now I'll pass it off to Aiden to start uh, talking about our individual subsystems. Thank you, Sean. So for our payload, um, we'll just start with uh, an overview of what our, our payload is. So uh, as discussed previously, our, our main goal for the payload is taking a, an image of an amateur radio operator. So to accomplish this, there's a couple of requirements that we have. Um, so we need a proper field of view. Uh, we need to match a an appropriate ground resolution, and we want to minimize the pixel blur because we don't want uh, a blurry picture for the amateur radio operator. Um, and I'll just point out quickly. Uh, sorry, you're say something. Sure. Okay. Then sorry, I'll I'll make a pause real quick and I'll restart after. Uh, but do we have any questions? From from anyone in the room? Okay, then I'll just move on. <laughs> um, so yeah, so as as I was saying, I'll just like to point out quickly um, the reason that we'd like to have this payload in space in the first place uh, is the again the goal is to take uh, continuous pictures when requested of amateur radio operators and. The options for doing this from the ground would be either having planes, uh, balloons, drones, etc. Uh, and there's a lot of overhead in terms of manpower and costs for launching this multiple times a day uh, to keep this operational 24-7. So there's a trade-off for upfront costs for launch, but it allows us to have the system in orbit 24-7 for a year plus uh, without any of the additional costs associated with having it based off the ground. Uh, it also provides some educational value. Um, it encourages the ability to uh, have people of the general public interact with uh, our spacecraft. And this is also a, a bit of a novel way of doing a selfie stat, which has been done before, but hasn't always uh, incorporated the amateur radio operator. Um, moving on to see uh, a bit more of the, the payload specifically. Um, there is image compression necessary in order to uh, downlink the image because we have a very large image uh, straight from the sensor. So we will be using some compression in order to uh, get it within our constraints for, for our downlinking budget. Um, so there are some trade-offs there uh, for lossy versus lossless compression. Um, I'll talk a bit more, but we are going with a lossy compression in order to get the image down as soon as possible. So here are some of a bit more detailed requirements for a payload. Um, the main things are, uh, as mentioned before, the field of view, uh, vibrations from launch, um, spatial resolution, uh, the, the optics need to fit within our um, the, the physical chassis, and as well, as I mentioned, the pixel blur must be less than a quarter per pixel. Um, and the reason is for this is, um, Sorry. And the reason for all of these are partly from CSDC, but also to ensure that we have good image quality for the amateur radio operator when they receive their image. So for the characteristics of our uh, payload, our main philosophy here was simplicity in design. The reason for this is it allows us to quickly create our, our 
payload and test it within the span of a year that we have left in our competition. So in order to achieve this, we decided to have no moving parts and to assume that the Earth is focused at infinity. Um, and to implement this, our sensor, as mentioned before, is the Sony IMX477, and this is included with the Raspberry Pi high quality camera. And this allows us very tight integration with OBC, which is using a Raspberry Pi. Um, and we also have ex previous experience with this sensor. And as well, it is an affordable sensor, so it helps fit our budget a bit better. For the telescope, we're using a Keplerian telescope and we are designing it in-house. Um, we have previous experience on the team working with this kind of optics, so that is that will help with our design uh, speed and uh, abilities. And again, going back to image compression, so we are going to be using a JPEG image compression, uh, which is easy to implement. It's quick um, and it allows us variable compression. So there will be some loss, but as the max image is going to be 6.2 megabytes and we need to be able to downlink at uh, 108 kilobytes, it'll allow us to get enough compression quickly to get it to the ground uh, at a suitable size. So here is our uh, layout for what the payload sequence will look like. Uh, so at launch, we have decided to assume that we are only taking pictures during daylight. Uh, the reasons for this is it allows us to uh, assume a roughly constant lighting, which simplifies our design and our concept of operations. Uh, it also helps us minimize exposure time, which is important for uh, attitude determination. Having long exposure times increases the uh, chance for blur in the picture. So the parameters for the shutter speed will and ISO will be set at launch as a default. And then in our launch and early orbit phase, we will be doing a bunch of testing with test pictures and adjusting that ISO and shutter speed according to our results to improve image quality. Uh, and then from there, we will go into the normal, the nominal sequence of operations, as you can see here. Uh, I will mention as well that we are considering having a nighttime operation as well, and that will depend on the test photos that we take. And we will try and have a, a secondary mode for nighttime operation. Uh, but again, for now, we're assuming just daylight to simplify our, our concept of operations. So as Sean mentioned as well, we're thinking of having, sorry, you didn't mention that. Take that back. Sean hasn't mentioned this yet. Uh, we are also thinking of having a secondary mission for the payload. Um, there's an opportunity provided by uh, the CSA called the CubeSats Initiative for Can in Canada for STEM or Cubix, and it's allowing us the opportunity to apply for more funding for a secondary payload on satellite. Um, and this also allows us to take advantage of having uh, our system in space. There's going to be downtime between each operator's request to the satellite where the satellite won't really be doing much and we'd like to take advantage of that and put it towards some scientific effort so so we have some requirements and goals for this though uh, we don't want to change any of the parameters that we've already decided for the payload and the rest of the system so we want to take advantage of the current payload design um, but we may explore some lossless compression uh, because for scientific applications, you want as much data from the image as possible. We're also aligning our design for this secondary payload with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There's 17 of them, but I'll mention quickly, there's no poverty, no hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, and clean water and sanitation. So for our ideations, we're focusing on these to get the best scientific and good for humanity goals for our secondary payload. So. We have three ideas here that I'd like to mention, um, imaging farmland, uh, imaging glaciers, and imaging forestry. And we'll be exploring these in more depth over the next couple months as we uh, flesh out our secondary payload a bit more. That being said, I'd like to invite our third speaker, Jacob, up to the stage to talk about the spacecraft. Oh, yeah, we can payload the first talk. I'll just jump right into it. So, um, yeah. Okay. But is the idea that you would get the command uh, from the radio operator, take the picture, and then download the data within that 20 minute uh, window? Or is this something that you would send back the next time you go over that particular area? So, it, it depends on when we'd be passing over them. So, uh, we should look at this now, actually. Um, there, we, we have a, a predefined um, 
sequence that will happen. Um, do, you, do you have a better answer for it? Uh, yes, the mission has put forth by the CSBC uh, is, uh, yeah, what you said is the, the latter is take the picture and then send it immediately to the operator. Um, we've opted to have memory storage um, on board to hold a, a copy of the photo um, just so we can uh, transmit it down if there's something happening to its transmission. Um, but for nominal operations, just to take a picture and then immediately adapt to it. And do you have like a certain range that you can be within the like the close to the person? Like presumably you get 30 meter resolution, they can't be like you know a thousand kilometers away. Yes. Uh so to your orbit, the furthest point away is about two thousand four hundred uh kilometers. Okay. Um and then that brings us that that's right at the horizon. And then when we are directly over top, we're at uh our nominal altitude of about four to six hundred, and that's when we take the picture. I think so. And then for the remaining half um, is when we have the window to to down link it to the. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now we'll be reviewing the spacecraft structure and mechanical enclosure. This is just an overview of the spacecraft structure itself, with an isometric view and a top-down view and side view. As you can see, uh, each side face has six solar cells with the payload at the top of the positive Z direction. Um, you can see as well, all uh, dimensions are in millimeters um, and the dimensions of the satellite itself meet the requirements set out by the competition. Uh, on, the expo on the reverse side of the satellite, which is obstructed in this view, um, there's also an area for sun sensors. Um, and uh, this is obstructed in this view but that side face of the satellite has only four solar cells instead of the six to allow for that um, uh, area. The spacecraft structure overview. Um, so the mass is just over two kilograms. This is within the requirement of one to four kilograms. And this is a table that outlines the offset in the center of mass of the satellite. So you can see in the X and Y planes, um, it's quite close to the center of mass. The geometric center of the satellite is the um, sort of centered, not based on an origin point, but, but rather with the origin in the very center of the structure itself. Um, and so the allowances for the X and Y directions can be off by 20 millimeters. So of course, this is well within those margins. And for the Z axis, so along the length of the satellite, it's 70 millimeters. Uh, again, so we're in uh, acceptable ranges here. The moments of inertia as well are uh, all listed below, um, and that's all calculated from the SOLIDWORKS model that we have of the satellite, taking into account the um, the PCBs that are within uh, the satellite. And so all of this information is then relayed off to other subsystems, uh, primarily ADCS, so that they can generate accurate models for the attitude control uh, of the satellite. So just to uh, go into the static analysis now, um, this is the model itself, finite element model. The element sizes are six millimeters with just under 75,000 uh, nodes. Um, the chassis itself is like the focus of the static analysis, so we're not looking at the forces played into um, other components within the satellite. We're just looking, in this case, forces acting on the chassis itself. Um, the chassis is, is fabricated with two end plates and two side faces, which are connected together using countersunk uh, connections. Um, these are just some uh, mechanical and material overviews of the, uh, of the chassis material. It's hard anodized aluminum, um, and the first four um, parameters you see there are specifically important for the static analysis. And the thermal expansion coefficient is used uh, is critical for the thermal simulations, which we'll be going over after. The mass density is just over uh, is is twenty seven hundred kilometers kilograms per meter cubed, um, which is uh, very important as well for the static analysis. So for the static analysis, we first look at the Z direction. So along the length of the satellite chassis, we apply a 12 G load um, to the satellite in both directions. And so you can see the lighter blue uh, and green are higher loads and the darker blue is a lower load or lower uh, stress on the satellite itself. And so you can hopefully see that at the top face and bottom faces of the satellite, there are these regions that are slightly lighter green. So there's areas of higher stress compared to the uh, rigid body of the satellite. 
The reason for that is because that is where there's kind of some screw connections are that connect the top two faces to this top to the side two faces. Um, those connections are modeled as indestructible countersunk screws with uh, spider connections to connect the top plate to the side faces. Um, and so a very important part of the stack analysis is to make sure that those regions aren't under too much load. We're really not as concerned about the uh, middle structure of the satellite. It's more about those two end pieces, especially in the positive Z direction. And again, that's a 12 G load on the, um, on the Z axis. And so we're simulating each axis individually instead of loads uh, together, just so that we can look uh, precisely at which direction the force is being applied. Um, and so the idea with these static analysis is, is to validate the mechanical structure itself. This is a factor of safety of the uh, frame. Um, in hopefully you can see, maybe we'll have to zoom that in later. But the factor of safety on this is very high for 12G load. We have a factor of safety of almost over 900, um, which is arguably too high. And so what we can infer from that is that we can actually slim down certain structural members of the frame to save on mass in the actual structure itself. Again, what we're looking at here, uh, importantly, are the top and bottom connections to make sure that the factor of safety is much greater than one. Um, the factor of safety is the load applied versus the load that can handle. Um, and so we're looking for failure modes, um, especially at those connection points. So that's the plus and minus said. And then X and Y, you can see here, you see similar sort of uh, um, stress uh, deformations at the top and bottom of the structure. For the X, factor of safety similarly, and for the Y as well. However, for the Y, you can see that the load is being applied in the direction of those cross beams. So those are actually where we see the most uh, deformation. Um, but as well, because of the factor of safety being very high in this case, um, slightly over 500, um, we're not concerned about any sort of mechanical uh, deformation or mechanical failure uh, under a 12G load. And so that's the maximum load we would expect to see on launch um, and the, the early orbit phase uh, of the satellite. So we'll go into the normal mode vibration analysis now. And so this is a graph of the frequency of vibration at um, the first few more normal nodes. Um, the primary thing is to understand that at the first mode, the, the mode of vibration is higher than 90 hertz, which is the requirement for the competition. We're actually looking at a, a frequency of around 400 hertz at the first mode, um, which, is, which is quite a bit higher than the minimum required. Um, the reason that this um, is important to consider is because during launch, the rocket itself will be vibrating at a frequency uh, lower than 90 hertz. And so we want to make sure that the satellite is a rigid body within that vibrating region to make sure that the energy is not being passed into the satellite and potentially damaging uh, critical components um, in the structure. And so you can see here, um, this is the first normal mode. Just to explain the geometry a little bit of when the satellite is inside of the P pod. The P pod has a smaller amount of tolerance on each X and Y phase. So in this scenario, the two blue structures that are running vertically are actually um, rigidly connected to the side of the P-pod. And this front member here is also rigidly connected, but only in one direction. So the normal force it can support is in the positive Y direction, but it allows for deformation in the minus Y direction, which is why you see here for the normal mode, it actually is being deformed away from the positive Y uh, direction. Um, the sort of scale that we have here makes it look quite a bit more dramatic than it actually would. So these deformations would be on the order of um, less than a tenth of a millimeter or half a millimeter. Um, also about the boundary conditions, continuing on, um, we have the two uh, long rails fixed. We also have one of the bottom nodes fixed and two of them um, supported with rollers in the SOLIDWORKS simulation. The third bottom point, so this one here, um, is allowed to move, which actually allows for a rotation of the satellite inside of the P-pod. Um, and so this is a sort of important boundary condition to consider while we do these normal analyses. So this is the first uh, mode of vibration. You can see the, the uh, deformation in the negative Y axis. The second mode is quite a bit more um, interesting in that it deflects both members outwards. Um, however, this one is actually supported um, by the side structure of the P-pod. This is just sort of a, uh, a trick with the SOLIDWORKS simulation. 
And then the third normal mode you can see is more of an S curve um, as the frequency increases. Um, now to briefly go over the mass budget. Um, our total maximum target mass is four kilograms. And so as an overview, our total mass is 2,500 grams, which is uh, significantly below our maximum. Um, our breakdown in terms of the different subsystems are primarily for power, mechanical, and uh, ADCS. So ADCS has uh, reaction wheels like magnetic torquers. The mechanical is structure itself. The chassis of the satellite is quite heavy. And then the remaining 25% um, is allocated to primarily the batteries and the power distribution of the, uh, of the power subsystem. The OBC payload and communication subsystems are quite low comparatively just because they're small uh, printed circuit boards and the camera in the case of payload. Um, but you can see there the mass is laid out um, and of allocated masses, um, most actually fall within the 80 to 90 percent range just because the communication subsystem, for instance, is allocated much less mass than the ADCS subsystem. Um, the 20 percent allocation in the um, in the total mass, so 3200 grams, um, is actually to just take into account variations in the masses that we have um, in our simulation. So let's say the mass of a PCB that hasn't been completely designed yet isn't entirely known. So we have that 20 percent contingency. Um, in case there's variations there. But um, the the takeaway from the, the overview of the mass budget here is that our satellite itself, um, as of right now, is around 2,500 grams, which is significantly below the, uh, the requirement um, a maximum of four kilograms. So now to go into the thermal analysis of the satellite. As an overview, there is three ways that the satellite um, sort of gains heat. Um, while it's in orbit. The first is from solar radiation, of course. This is the energy that comes from the sun. Uh, the solar cells convert this energy into electrical power, which the satellite uses for its operations. The second is Earth IR. So this is the infrared energy that's being radiated out from the Earth um, due to the, um, the convection currents in the Earth's core. And then the third is Earth albedo, which is reflected sunlight from the sun off of the Earth's surface. So this can be reflected off of a dense cloud cover, uh, Arctic, um, ice sheets, um, and other reflective materials. And so those are the three ways that the satellite actually gains energy. And then the satellite emits that energy out into space. The, each of these three heat transfer equations have a coefficient. Um, and so the coefficient, let's say, for solar radiation is much, much greater than that of the Earth IR, just because the satellite actually gains much more energy from solar radiation than from IR. So for instance, in a uh, in uh, the hot case, for instance, the solar radiation uh, coefficient might be fourteen thousand, whereas the Earth's is more on the order of one or two hundred. So that's a sense of where the energy is coming from, primarily just from the sun. Um, this is all modeled as gray body emissions, and the the um, the view factor, so the amount of area that the satellite collects from the Earth's IR and albedo, is actually just calculated from the altitude away from the Earth the satellite is. Um, based on the area of the satellite that collects that energy. Um, also, a model in uh, MATLAB was used to uh, generate the view factor um, because this actually varies as the orbit continues uh, around the Earth. There are two cases under these simulations. The first is sort of a hot case or best case scenario where it's generating or collecting the most amount of heat. And the second is a cold case where it's uh, generating the least. And these vary based on the orbital parameters um, but also, as you can see on the right hand side, the position of the satellite with respect to the Earth. Um, and so here we've laid out um, several uh, coefficients that relate to both the hot and cold case. Um, and so uh, you can see there that the camera face is always pointing towards the Earth. And then from there, we can collect information about that. Also, just as a sort of uh, assumption about these simulations, the inclination is zero. So it's a circular orbit around the Earth. Um, and so this is something that can be approved upon in uh, future simulations is to simulate it at different inclination uh, levels. So um, this is a chart essentially of the primary components of a satellite with operating ranges of components. So you can see that the lowest operating ranges is around negative 40, which is where most components um, cannot uh, operate um, effectively. So that's most of the power generation and communications 
as well as the uh, sun sensors. And most um, components are good up to around 80 to 60 degrees Celsius. And so under thermal simulations, we need to ensure that all of these components are well within their operating range. These components also dissipate their own energy. For instance, just storing energy in the batteries itself um, emits energy into the satellite structure. And so this is also something that is taken into account in the thermal simulations, uh, which we'll go into next. The total power dissipation just from the components itself is 2.3 watts. Um, another important thing for these thermal simulations are the emissivity and absorptivity of certain materials. So fiberglass, solar cells, the aluminum of the chassis itself and the batteries all have their own um, they all have their own way of transferring heat between objects. So the fiberglass, for instance, will emit energy much less quickly than the aluminum of the chassis itself. Um, other parameters such as the density, the thermal conductivity and the heat capacity affect the way that the, um, the satellite energy is transferred through conduction and convection. Um, and so this is all, these are all component or uh, parameters that are put into SOLIDWORKS so that we can have an overview and a, um, and a good simulation of heat transfer. Um, yep. And so this is some interesting data about different subsystems on the satellite in both the cold case and the hot case. So you can see that the batteries are being held at a constant above room temperature. This is because the battery board has a heater dedicated to keeping the batteries warm. The lens hood and camera sensor both dip below um, room temperature, but within their operating range, and then dip back up um, on the uh, opposite side of the simulation, on the opposite side of the orbit itself, rather. And you can see as well for the hot case, um, in the battery uh, heater itself, we have a thermostat that would regulate it based on the internal temperature of the satellite. So these are the pictures of the simulations themselves. So these are transient simulations, so it's just one look at time. Uh, for the cold case, you can see the batteries themselves are highlighted in red. So that's where a heater would be placed under the batteries. Um, and then that heat would be transferred throughout the satellite. This takes into account as well the uh, energy emitted from subsystems themselves. So as electronics are powered on and powered off, as batteries uh, dissipate and charge, as the, the camera sensor takes pictures and relate, remains inactive, that all changes the way that energy is trans uh, is moved through the system. And so we have to uh, take a minimum and a maximum temperature in both those cases. Um, and you can see, interestingly, that the camera sensor itself is actually a little bit warmer than the surrounding area. That is in part due to the emissivity of the camera sensor, but also because that is the component that's facing towards Earth. So that's collecting most of the Earth IR energy. That's the cold case. And then we can see the hot case here, uh, similar sort of uh, graphic. Um, the battery heater um, temperature is actually determined through the um, through the operating temperature. So we need to just increase the battery heater power output until all components arise above the um, their minimum requirements. So does anyone have questions about any thermal simulations or static or vibration analysis before we move on to the power subsystem? Are you looking for like suggestions from No, you, you can um, actually, I guess so. Yeah, for, for improvements, I think after. Yeah, so general like, questions of the I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, so I was wondering, okay. so I guess the cool case is not when the satellite is in the Earth's shadow. Is that correct? So, because it looks like there's oh, so there's solar IR flux. Mm -hmm. So the cold case isn't just when it's um, eclipsed. The cold case is also based on um, the the altitude of the satellite, and also based on the uh, time of the year. So based on how far away that the Earth itself is away from the sun, is as um, as the the amount of like perigee energy changes, that changes the amount of solar radiation that you can uh, collect. And so the hot case is essentially a scenario where we absorb as much possible energy into the system um, based on like a variety of parameters and the cold case is the opposite. So that takes into account as well time of year. So is this like averaged over a certain amount of time? I, I, I guess I'm not clear about this because I would think like 
naively, if you were in the shadow of this, of like a, in the earth shadow, mm -hmm. then it would get very cold pretty quickly, right? Um, yeah. But is it, does that not matter because um, you'll be back in the sun fairly quickly? Or I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what, uh, what time you're kind of integrating over to get. So these these charts themselves just look at one orbit. Okay, so, so average over orbit. Yeah. Okay. So in, in the hot case, you still see that drop off in temperature, okay. but then the temperature rises much more rapidly. Whereas in the cold case, it just it rises like at a much slower rate of change. Okay. And so in the cold case, that sort of infers to us that we need to um, use, let's say, battery heaters a lot more. Um, we have to use that tool a lot more compared to the hot case, where the satellite will actually collect its own energy sort of passively just from the sun. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's yeah. what I was missing was that okay. the table is giving values average over the orbit. Over one, okay. You probably said that. And I just... Okay, I'll make sure the right is answer the next one too. Then, um, any other questions for thermal though, or vibration or? Okay, we're going to move on to power then. Oops. Okay. Yep, so this is the overview of the power subsystem. At a high level, from your left side of the screen to your right side of the screen is power in and power collected versus power out. So on the left side, we have solar cells. There's two solar, there's six solar cells per face of the satellite on positive X and Y um, and negative X and Y. Um, I stated earlier in the presentation actually that there's only four on the negative Y uh, face of the satellite. Um, however, uh, there's two solar panels um, per direction. Those solar panels are fed into battery charging regulators, which are incorporated in the Clyde EPS module. So this is a module that we've uh, that the team has previously purchased from Clyde, which is a commercial off the shelf, off the shelf um, space uh, um, parts company. Um, that module incorporates uh, USB charging, so that when the satellite is on the ground during integration and testing, the batteries can be charged externally. Um, it includes these battery charging regulators, which are fed from the solar panels. It also includes power conditioning um, after the batteries. So the batteries are four um, Panasonic 18650 lithium ion batteries, um, and those are in the middle of the screen there. So that's our energy storage. That is uh, not part of the EPS module, but they feed into the EPS module for their uh, power conditioning. And that's where we have um, uh, overcurrent switches, which uh, verify that the unregulated power buses are not drawing too much power. Those then feed into uh, power distribution modules. So there's 10 switches, three for the 3.3 volt line, three for the 5 volt line, and then two each for the 12 volt line and battery voltage line. And so those are individually controlled from the OBC. And if um, an LCL trips, that uh, power line then has to be reset even after the overcurrent um, is released the uh, line has to be reset from the OBC. There are also, as you can see in the diagram, um, limit switches or cutoff switches for battery isolation. So the batteries are in a 2S2P configuration, but they still need to be able to, um, to be uh, disconnected from the subsystem in case of um, um, before launch, they need to be disconnected so that they don't deplete um, and so that we have full batteries upon launch. An overview of power generation. So as I said er earlier, there's six um, static um, Azure Space solar cells. So Azure Space is a manufacturer of CTJ30 uh, solar cells, um, and six of those per XY face. And so just uh, as an overview, you can see the, the uh, power generated per orbit and the, ex the exposed versus eclipsed time um, for each of our three main simulated um, orbits. So our sun synchronous orbits generally get around 14 and a half hours of exposure per day or per orbit. Um, and the International Space Station is a slightly less uh, exposure time just based on the inclination um, of that orbit. Um, so you can see that the inclination of the sun synchronous orbits is around 96 degrees, so it's very inclined on the Earth. Um, whereas the International Space Station is much more reasonably inclined at around 50 degrees. Um, the simulation for these sun synchronous orbits have a local time of ascending node of uh, 1030. So that's the time, uh, the local time that the satellite crosses the equator. The um, International Space Station orbit always has the same right angle of ascending node of 84 degrees. So that's the 84 degree latitude cross time uh, of the equator for the satellite. And so you can see there at the bottom of the screen is a sample chart that's generated from SDK. 
So that's a software uh, toolkit um, that's been used to simulate these uh, power generation numbers. And so we put input the uh, satellite model into SDK. We define solar panels as individual groups on a satellite. And then we look at how those groups paired with the area of the solar cells and the efficiency of the solar cells generate power over an orbit. So that of course varies with the different orbital parameters, but you can see for the sun synchronous orbits, we generate around 22 watts per orbit and the International Space Station orbit is slightly less. So uh, our power shortage is four Panasonic 18650 batteries. Each battery has a nominal voltage of 3.6 volts and a capacity of 3450 milliamp hours. The batteries are arranged in a 2S 2P configuration. So that means that two batteries are in series with each other, and then both of those groups are connected in parallel to the power conditioning module. The reason we chose a 2S 2P configuration is because it allows for contingency in case one battery breaks. If all four were in series, then your energy storage system would essentially fail. So um, by putting them in parallel, we allow for contingency in case one battery uh, breaks. Also, by putting them in series, however, you gain an extra step up in voltage. So we considered various different uh, configurations, but this found uh, we found this to have the best balance between stepping up voltage and contingency on that side of things. This arrangement of uh, batteries provides a 70% required of energy um, for one orbit, and that's an internal uh, requirement as well as a CSDC requirement. Uh, the batteries have each a depth of discharge of 2.5 volts, so that is not as a system itself, but just each individual battery, and each individual battery has a maximum power output of 2.5 watts. Um, these batteries have flight heritage, so they were used on the NASA Marco mission in 2018. That was a pair of satellites that were sent along with a lander to Mars to um, take pictures of the lander landing on the uh, Martian surface. They've been radiation tested and um, survive 97% of capacity after 20 megarad, which is significantly more radiation than we would see um, anywhere in a LEO orbit for a lifetime of over 10 years. Um, they also have a reasonable uh, temperature operating range. So for discharge, minus 20 to plus 60, and for charging, 10 degrees to 45 degrees. Um, these values were also taken um, into account for our thermal simulation. Um, and as such, we found that a battery heater is necessary to keep them within that uh, minus 20 range. And so that battery heater with a thermostat on the battery board will keep them within their operating temperature range. Next is power regulation and distribution. So the first is um, for charging. We can always, once the entire satellite is um, integrated, we can charge through an external five volt USB charging uh, connector. And so that's so that we don't have to charge through the solar panels while the system is um, integrated together. We have we can top up the batteries whenever we like, just with an external connector. While the satellite is in orbit itself, there's two charging modes on the Clyde EPS module. The first is maximum power point tracking, and so this is used for rapid battery charging. It takes the uh, solar panel pair that has the most power output. So, for instance, if you imagine that a satellite is orbiting the Earth, only one of two x y or positive x negative x um, solar cells will actually be illuminated to the Earth. And so the MPPT takes the pair that is generated the most possible output and charges the batteries that way. Um, the next mode is used when the batteries are close to fully charged, and that's the end of charge mode. And so that draws only enough power from the solar cells to just trickle charge the batteries. Um, any additional power that was fed into the batteries could um, be problematic um, in terms of overcharging the batteries. So we don't want to put too much power into batteries. Um, and in the end of charge mode, we actually leave some of the energy on the solar cells themselves as heat, and that heat is then dissipated out into the environment. Um, and so this energy or this charging mode is only used when the batteries are close to being fully charged. The power distribution um, is primarily 10 commandable PDMs. So these are PDMs that can be controlled from the command and data handling subsystem. Command and data handling subsystem can send commands to turn on and off um, different uh, PDMs based on whether or not, let's say, the communication subsystem needs to be active um, or it can be turned off uh, temporarily. That's especially important for the survival mode when most subsystems will be uh, cut short and uh, power generation will be the focus. 
um, each um, each of these PDMs has built in protection methods. So the first is for um, uh, overcurrent protection. So if an overcurrent is detected, that PDM will immediately be shut off by the module itself, and it could be only restarted with a command from the OBC. Even if the overcurrent is no longer present, the OBC still needs to recognize that an overcurrent did occur so that it can go through its diagnostic testing to make sure that everything on that power rail is, um, is in good condition to be powered back on. The EPS module also has a battery under voltage protection, um, in which case that telemetry can be sent over an I2C connection to the CDH um, to make sure that it can go through that um, failure mode analysis and make sure that the batteries don't get undercharged. Now to go to the power budget. Um, the um, parameters used for the power budget were divided into the operational states of the satellite. And so for the early um, early launch and orbit uh, phase, this is primarily detumbling. Um, so the majority of the power is put right into the megatorkers to stabilize the satellite as it's detumbling. In a default pass, we've set around 50% duty cycle. So that's primarily waiting for communications um, uh, 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 relays and um, power going to the CDH to make sure that we're listening for those events. Um, in a pass mode, um, we have determined that most of our power will be used for reaction wheels for stabilization and payload in taking a picture itself. For the safe holds, um, we've said that 15% duty cycle would be reasonable for the command and data handling subsection to control other subsystems, and make sure that we're in a reasonable um, power state. And for survival, we are focused only on power generation, and we have a 5% duty cycle. Most of our subsystems themselves would actually be turned straight off uh, in that mode. You can see an overview for the different subsystems here. Um, and so those percentages that I outlined above really are just a, a general sense um, during each operational phase. So for instance, like I said, in survival, a lot of the, the subsystems would be completely turned off. But you can see an overview of each subsystem in terms of the nominal power used. Um, so ADCS, for instance, would use um, 135 watts um, in one orbit, but only at 100% duty cycle. So we really have to be careful in modifying that duty cycle so that each subsystem doesn't um, overcharge or isn't budgeted too much power. You can see the depth of discharge is listed at 104.7%. Of course, that's very unrealistic because you can't fully deplete the batteries past what their capacity is. Um, and so that's something that we need to look at in terms of the power budgeting and get more fine um, duty cycles on each operational phase so that we can look at each component, the amount of power that it's drawing in that operational phase, and therefore determine a more realistic answer for how much power uh, we're using in each of those phases. Um, does anyone have questions about the power subsystem before we move on? I think that might be covered in CDH. No, OK. Um, do you have a specific question about it now that I can answer as yeah. a part of power? Okay. Will you have like a, 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 a specific question about the system that like monitors power usage or at least like monitors just three charge and things only to like a phase mode and that's yeah, so the telemetry from the, the EPS, the EPS module collects telemetry based on the 10 uh, PGMs, so voltage um, and uh, current that's being drawn through each of those PGMs, but then also the states of the batteries, so the amount of, um, of uh, the voltage of the batteries, the amount of current that's being drawn from them. And so that's all telemetry that can be dumped um, into the OBC through like CDH. Um, and so that is read, I believe, every five seconds. The EPS um, module collects that data every five seconds, and it can be um, requested from the OBC as part of a telemetry like package or a telemetry dump. Okay, so the power system itself, uh, which you bought, can monitor the um, the current that's being drawn from the batteries. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then, in the case of an overcurrent, the EPS will shut itself off. Yeah. But if there's no overcurrent or no like operational failure. All of that telemetry has to be requested from uh, the onboard computer. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on to ADCS now. Okay, so for attitude and orbit determination control, I'll probably switch between that and ADCS. Um, our main purpose is for determining 
obviously the attitude of the satellite. And so this is the rotation with respect to an inertial frame. And so in our case, the inertial frame is a geodetic frame where the Z plus axis is aligned with the uh, geodetic nadir, so center of the Earth. Um, X plus velocity is the velocity of the satellite, and then Y plus um, satisfies the right-hand rule. So in this picture here, this um, axis there is the satellite's axis, which is the body, the body frame aligned in line with the inertial frame. So in this case, they're the same thing. But if it were to rotate, then the inertial frame would stay with those axes and the body frame would be the one rotating. So then the other two parts of the ADCS system are to provide pointing capabilities. So that's mostly for the payload, which would be fine pointing because we need precise, accurate um, attitude control, um, as well as course pointing for communications, uh, EPS, and for thermal mitigation. So if there's a part that's too hot and sun hiding, or if a part that's too cold, at Etc. Uh, finally, ADCS needs to communicate with OBC, so we need to know what mode of operation we're in, uh, and we need to provide telemetry back to OBC. So here are some of uh, the requirements for AODCS. Um, the main one, obviously, is payload. So the two degrees is uh, a requirement from the CSDC. We're basically getting a quarter of the long track field of view, which uh, equates to two degrees. Um, and then the orbital accuracy is uh, an extension of that. It's how much play we have in getting the uh, subject in feel in frame of the of the payload uh, with that two degree accuracy. Um, the jitter here is to reduce pixel blur. Uh, in order to get the pixel blur within a single pixel, we need one degree per second jitter. Uh, and then finally, the attitude knowledge accuracy is an internal requirement uh, in order to achieve the two degree point in accuracy. Uh, for now, this is a bit of a rough estimate. Uh, we have, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but we have a simulation that we're developing for the attitude determination and control that we will be fine tuning this requirement for one degree knowledge, uh, attitude knowledge. So here's a bit of a block diagram overview of the attitude determination and control system. So. I'll go into details for each of the sensors and actuators, uh, but I'd like to focus uh, here on the microcontroller. So we have a dedicated onboard computer for uh, the ADCS system. Uh, it's gonna be an SDM32 microcontroller. We're currently in the works of uh, choosing exactly which one, but there's a lot of supply shortages, so we haven't uh, been able to procure one yet. Um, and then associated with that microcontroller is a custom circuit uh, because there's not enough space for a breakout board for the controller. Uh, so that we won't go into it in too much detail, but that is something that we are also working on. Um, and then associated with that microcontroller, we have control code uh, and the simulation that I mentioned. So the simulation we had previously was designed in Simulink, uh, but had a lot of limitations. So we're redesigning it this year in C++. And what that'll allow us to do is test the control code directly in the simulation. And then the same control code that we're testing on the simulation will be used in on the hardware. So here are uh, just going into the different modes that uh, ADCS is in in a bit more detail. So detumble is right after launch. Uh, the satellite will be uh, spinning at an unknown angular frequency. Um, pointing mode is, as we covered before, either for payload or the other systems. Um, and then desaturation is for the reaction wheels. Reaction wheels, when they spin too fast, they they max out their speed, and so you can't turn the satellite anymore. So we need to desaturate them, and that will be using the magnet workers. The different algorithms we're using are laid out here. So the B dot is for uh, magnet workers. That's for detumble. So in order to determine how much current to put through all the magnet worker coils, we use the B dot algor algorithm along with our attitude knowledge. The triad uh, algorithm is used for um, determining the actual attitude from the measurements that we're taking from our sensors. And then the SPG4 is an orbit model that we will be using because we don't have any onboard orbit determination. So we will be using that model to uh, estimate where we are in orbit. Uh, the control and sample frequencies here are um, estimates as well. We have got these from looking at past satellites uh, and um, some records and papers that have been written, um, but we are planning to use the uh, physics model that we've been developing to fine tune these a little bit. So we'll be starting with one hertz uh, for control and sampling frequencies, and then adjusting that and seeing how it affects our, our control capabilities. Um, finally, the tel telemetry that you can see here 
basically anything that is important for uh, attitude, knowledge, and control will be sent to OBC, and when necessary, failures will be sent as well. So going a bit more detail uh, for our sensors, um, the main sensors that we are using are a uh, photodiode-based system. Um, we have two uh, sets of photodiodes. We have one for fine control, sorry, fine knowledge, and one for coarse knowledge. So the way that our fine sun sensors are working are there's three photodiodes per long face of the, sat of the satellite at an inclination, and that inclination angle is designed first to give us four pi steradian coverage of the entire satellite, as well as to maximize the um, accuracy of those um, of those sensors. So from uh, the RAX2 satellite, which uh, has proven this method, uh, the angle should be about 46 degrees, and they have developed a uh, calibration technique during detumble that we will be using as well uh, to, to calibrate these sun sensors. Uh, their control accuracy here was around one degree, but that was for the entire system. So that's what we're expecting out of this design, but we will be ratifying that not only in the simulation, but physically uh, with some physical testing as well. Uh, the core sensors mentioned there are purely a backup. So if the sun sensors were to fail entirely, then it would basically prevent any attitude knowledge uh, or extremely degraded attitude knowledge. So the core sensors are there as a backup uh, so that even if the fine sensors fail, then we have one photodiode uh, on each uh, long face of the satellite to get some idea of where the sun is. And if that fails, then we also have the option of using uh, solar panel voltage to determine a bit more of a rough idea of where this, the, the satellite is. Our second uh, main sensor is the IMU, the Inertial Measurement Unit. And so this contains three axis accelerometers, three axis gyroscopes, and three axis magnetometers. So the reason for this is it's a bit cheaper and easier to design a one unit um, inertia sensor instead of having dedicated accelerometers, gyroscopes, and uh, magnetometers. Um, I will mention that this is a hobby grade uh, sensor, so we understand that there is some risk with um, the accuracy uh, and especially the error of this unit. The accuracy and the granularity of each sensor meets our requirements, uh, but the we, we, we are planning on doing um, calibration in-house with for each of these sensors. And then depending on the results of our calibration, we have uh, a plan that could involve getting three of these. And what that would do is it, it would let us take three measurements, one from each unit, and then average them to reduce error. Uh, one thing I will also mention is that there is the, the risk of gyroscope drift. So typically gyroscopes drift between, on an hourly basis, uh, a couple of degrees. So there's a couple of ways that we'll be mitig mitigating that. The first is using other sensor measurements, such as sun sensors, as a, a guide. So we can use the, the, the change in sun sensor angle to determine how much our gyroscopes are drifting. Um, as well, there are most chips, including this one, have some sort of bias correction to, uh, to deal with drift. So we will be experimenting with how good the bias correction is on this. And again, the failure of this system would be detrimental. Uh, it's very hard to get any attitude determination without the inertial measurement. So um, base, we have two uh, IMUs. So if one fails, we have a backup. Uh, in, in the case that we go for the averaging, if we lose one, then we would have uh, lower accuracy, but we would still have two backups. So moving on to our actuators, our main me method of attitude control is the reaction wheels. So we have a uh, four reaction wheel system. And that allows, uh, first it allows us um, a bit more control with where we're putting uh, angular momentum for control. And second, it allows us to lose one reaction wheel and have full three axis control of the attitude system. Um, we can lose up to two reaction wheels while maintaining full control. It would just be a bit more difficult. Uh, but if we were to lose three or four reaction wheels, we would basically have no reaction, uh, no attitude control uh, on a fine scale. So the actual accuracy of these reaction wheels, we expect to be very good. Um, typically, satellites can get less than one degree accuracy with a reaction wheel system. Um, there isn't any specific details on these reaction wheels in particular, um, but we will be doing our own in-house test, in testing on the uh, attitude control accuracy of these, of these wheels. So 
things that could limit that are um, the controller board uh, that we have purchased, um, as well as the granularity of PWM control. So depending on how uh, fine your levels are for your PWM, that can affect uh, how the steps that you can get in uh, angular velocity increase. Uh, I will also mention that with reaction wheels, you don't want to do high velocities or low velocities with their angular velocities. So if you're too high, then you get to the saturation, which we talked about. Um, and then also if you're too low, uh, first of all, these have hall sensors. So if it's too low, the hall sensors are not as accurate. So you have a poorer idea of how fast they're spinning. And second, as you approach zero RPM, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of vibrations that can be created by the reaction wheels, so that could affect the payload uh, and the rest of the, the satellite. Our second means of control are the magnet torquers. So these are necessary mainly to prevent saturation of the reaction wheels, so they'll be used to desaturate the reaction wheels, and they're also used uh, during detumble. So we've opted to uh, build our own magnet torquer system. Um, this has been proven in other satellites, uh, and it's a lot cheaper than doing a commercial off-the-shelf option. Uh, and it also allows us tighter integration with the rest of the attitude determination and control system. So our design will have two ferrite coils, which are labeled coil one and coil two, and one air coil, uh, and that allows us to get all three axes with, with our uh, magnet workers. Um, and as I mentioned, these are not really used for pointing, they're more for desaturation. So we don't really expect very high uh, control accuracy with these. Um, if we were to have a failure with this system, then we would expect that at least with one coil failed, we would still be able to desaturate the reaction wheels. Um, but if we didn't have these at all, if the, the entire system failed, we would expect that our control would be um, almost entirely gone because our reaction wheels would saturate very quickly. Uh, just a quick overview of what the magnet torque circuits will look like. Um, the H bridge is meant to provide the switching of the currents through the inductor, and that allows us to change the direction of the magnetic field applied. Um, and that's driven by the gate driver, which helps do the logic for that switching. Uh, the digital potentiometer and uh, VCON are the way that we control the amount of current going through. So uh, VCON would be a PWM system uh, signal, and then the digital potentiometer also assists to uh, lower or increase the current. And then the low dropout regulator, the LDO, is used to increase voltage stability. And the last thing is that there's going to be three of these circuits, one for each uh, magnet worker. So finally, uh, for attitude, we also need to know our orbit. Uh, as I mentioned, we're not going to have any onboard orbit determination or control, so it will be entirely from the ground that we are determining this. So uh, in association with that, we have the SGB4 model on the satellite, and that will allow us to keep track of where we are uh, in orbit. And then to update that, we'll need regular updates from the ground on our current uh, position, as well as the uh, two-line element to update the SGB4 uh, model. So the, the two-line element that we'll be accessing is from spacetrack.org, which is provided by um, mostly NORAD and the US military. Um, and the, the basic flow would be grab the new two-line two element from spacetrack.org, uh, process it if necessary, uh, and then send it up to the satellite. So we expect that with this, we can at least, if the TLE is up updated every day, then we'd get about one kilometer accuracy. And as I mentioned before, we need plus or minus six kilometers. So, so long as this is updated every day and that's dependent on the API, then we expect that this should satisfy our requirements. But there is the risk that if our satellite isn't being tracked properly, that the, uh, the orbital model will drift over time. Uh, so with that, uh, if there are any questions on ADCS, I can, I can answer them now. Yeah. Yeah. On your reaction wheel slide, uh, you had mentioned that. So if these are the reaction wheels that we're going to be using, I guess we purchased them. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned that there was no information available for them. I was kind of wondering why that was. My understanding would be if we're purchasing them for the company, and we would be able to get like data sheets or whatever. Like so uh, yeah, I, I should clarify. We we have data sheets and we have the characteristics of the reaction wheels. What I meant by that was. There, there's no um, specific data on flight heritage uh, control for these. For these, so it's very hard to 
to determine exactly like per degree what your control is from a reaction wheel because it depends on the entire attitude system. So it depends on how good your sensor measurements are, how good your control code are, is, how good your circuits are, and any other errors that can happen. So that information isn't typically available. So that's that's what I meant when we don't really have specific details on the control of, of these wheels. Yeah. But uh, how are you going to do your attitude reconstruction uh, during nighttime conditions when you can't see the sun? Yeah, so for, for that, that will be uh, an issue. Um, right now, our, our, our idea is we will just try and keep track of, we will rely on the IMU to keep track of how we're changing in velocity. So there will be error buildup. Um, there's not really much that you can do about that. You, we could look into star trackers, but they're very expensive and very hard to implement. So yeah, right now our plan is while we're in daylight, we'll have our best case attitude uh, determination, and then we'll rely on the IMUs while we're away from the sun. And then once we get it back, we'll update, we'll, we'll check our, our estimation on where we are, and then we'll check with the sun sensor where we actually are and correct. Um, but obviously that depends on our orbit. So if we're in a sun synchronous orbit, orbit, it's less of a concern. It's more for the ISS that, that we would have to worry about that. Any other questions? Okay, great. So I'll pass it off to the communication system. So focusing on the communication system, uh, we've summarized the system with uh, three main objectives. Uh, the first objective is to provide half duplex communication between uh, two different channels. The first channel being between the self, uh, selfie sat and mission control or the ground station. And the second channel being the selfie sat and other amateur radio operators uh, around the globe. Uh, the second uh, system objective is to comply with all RF regulations, and these are imposed um, by uh, two uh, different sources. One is from the ITU, and the other one is from uh, Radio Amateurs of Canada, or also known as uh, RAC. Uh, the third system objective for the communication system is to prov provide the antenna deployment. And this is performed under a two command uh, deployment control uh, and provides actuation, so the actual deployment and then detection of the, the pre and post deployment states. So what we did after that, uh, we uh, specified these more into system requirements um, using uh, the CSDC requirements, the system objectives and the design work that we did with our link budget. And so the, the first uh, requirement is uh, based on the link budget and specifies an output power of 33 dBm uh, to ensure that the, the downlink channel from the satellite to uh, any operator on the ground um, will be uh, closed with a margin that exceeds uh, 3 dB. And the, this 3 dB is a, a requirement imposed by the CSDC. Uh, for the ses uh, second system uh, requirement, uh, this is also again based on the, the link budget. Um, we have a, a required sensitivity for our system of about uh, minus 123 dB, and this is to ensure that the, the uplink channel from the ground to the satellite um, will be closed uh, just as well with uh, a margin of uh, greater than 3 dB. Uh, for our uh, third requirement, um, we wanted to design the, the communication system uh, in mind with flexibility and reusability so that we may be able to use this in future missions uh, that QSET undertakes. Um, so we opted to have the communication system uh, as a standalone uh, system able to process data on its own. And additionally, um, this requirement does allow the system uh, to maintain communication, even if the, the OBC and the command and data handling unit uh, experiences any critical faults. The fourth system uh, requirement uh, includes uh, is focused on decryption. It's a requirement for us to be able to handle encrypted commands um, um, provided by mission control. And so we have opted for the communication communication system to be able to handle those encrypted commands.
Uh, lastly, our fifth uh, key system requirement for the communication system uh, focuses on our, our center frequencies and how we communicate with uh, amateur radio operators. And so for our downlink channel, our center frequency is 436 megahertz and our uplink uh, center frequency will be 146 megahertz. Um, and then these are specified by the uh, radio amateur uh, of Canada uh, band plans that we are now following. And then these are also uh, commonly used frequencies uh, across the globe for uh, amateur radio operators. So after establishing the system requirements, um, we started to outline it into uh, a system block diagram. And uh, the main features um, of our communication system can be broken down into two different boards. Uh, the first board being uh, the one handling all the digital and RF um, communication, and then the second board being the antenna deployment uh, that holds onto our radiators. So uh, the first board, the communication system board, um, has some key features that I'll just point out, and that includes uh, the MCU to handle the encryption and data throughput, as well as providing uh, the digital communication um, between the communication system and the rest of the uh, spacecraft bus um, through a RS-232 uh, protocol. And this protocol is uh, fairly standard on uh, CubeSat designs. Uh, the second uh, key features of the communication system board uh, include two transceivers, um, one each dedicated for uh, transmission and reception. And then each one of these transceivers uh, has an accompanying RF front end, including uh, amplifiers, filters, and an impedance matching circuit that goes off to, uh, to mate with the antennas. Um, we are using uh, dipole antennas for both uplink and downlink channel, um, just so we can provide omnidirectional um, uh, coverage for our communication system. Um, again, just following in line with the designing for uh, reusability and flexibility for our system. And just uh, additional uh, key features on the antenna deployment board. Uh, those include connections to the antennas, uh, the power resistors that we used for uh, antenna deployment, which melt uh, a burn wire and allows antennas to expand outside of the uh, dimensions of the deployment board. Uh, limit switches so we can provide uh, detection of the deployment state, as well as the RF uh, balance to convert the uh, unbalanced signal coming from the transceiver to the balanced signal going out to the uh, to the antennas. So uh, more specifications that go involved are that are involved into uh, both the communications on board the satellite as well as the, the ground station. Uh, so on board at the on board the satellite is uh, the the heart of our communication is the Texas Instruments CC1120 transceivers. And they are able to uh, communicate at uh, 9600 bits per second, which is a requirement imposed by the CSTC. They are they pro can provide uh, linear polarization and implement uh, AX25 uh, protocol, both of which uh, are requirements of the CSCC as well. The, the modulation scheme is the uh, default um, uh, modulation scheme used on these transceivers, um, and we've seen it be used in the past as well on other uh, CubeSat missions, so we've opted to uh, keep this modulation scheme uh, for our design as well. Uh, now on the ground, our mission control uh, system is located at the uh, neighboring Royal Military College of Canada, in which they have uh, a Yagi Uda antenna, which matches uh, the linear polarization of our communication system on board the satellite, as well as having a uh, 15 dBi uh, worth of gain, as well as uh, tracking capabilities. Um, so we can ensure that uh, during our communication window, we will have full access to the to our satellite. So focusing more on the the software that goes involved uh, into our communication system, 
on the ground, we're we're currently developing our own uh, user interface uh, for our ground station, and these this includes three three key elements. The first one is uh, a command line interface um, to send and receive messages and uh, transmissions between us and the the orbiting satellite. Uh, the the second feature is uh, implementing uh, a weather uh, application, and so we can see. Uh, feasibility and uh, the weather conditions uh, for uh, amateur radio operators that are requesting uh, images around the world. And then the third key feature is uh, an email integration uh, to help facilitate uh, the requests that we receive from other amateur radio operators. So moving on to the software, onto the uh, the selfie set. Um, most of our software is just written in C and C++ and focuses on uh, implementing uh, transmission and reception uh, using the uh, CC1120 transceivers, as well as providing functionality uh, for uh, decrypting the command received from mission control, as well as various support, including uh, telemetry, uh, monitoring status of the deployed antennas, uh, as well as providing uh, CW or Morse code uh, beacon signals. So further modeling, um, of which the, the team performed, can be summarized with the link budget. Um, and then this summarizes all the, the power gains and the power losses that are experienced through a communication channel. And so for uh, our satellite, we have two communication channels. One is the uplink and one is the downlink. And so summarizing all of the results, uh, our uplink as seen on the, the left-hand side, uh, we have a, a link margin of about 47 dB. So this means that we have 40, uh, 47 dB of excess power um, being received at the antenna from the ground. Uh, usually what you want as a rule of thumb is 3 dB plus or minus or plus a factor of safety of two. So we are, are well above uh, our minimum requirement. Uh, same with uh, the downlink. Uh, it's required to have a 3 dB uh, uh, minimum uh, power reception. And so having uh, just over 15 dB, we are well above that margin. Now, summarizing this into uh, a throughput budget, so we've used the, the orbit uh, simulation as well as our uh, link budget to establish how much telemetry and how much uh, payload data that we can uh, transmit uh, in a given day. So we've summarized the sources of our telemetry and our payload data in the, the top half of the, of the table here. And we're also including uh, overhead um, using the AX25 protocol. So we can include uh, flags, uh, bytes for uh, CRCs or circular redundancy checks, as well as source and destination uh, information for each transmission that are required or and as implemented by the, uh, the AX25 protocol. And so at the end of this table, it shows that we at most we need about 20 minutes of contact time per day, and this is directly in line with our worst case orbit simulation. So before moving on to uh, the CMDH system, does anyone have questions about our communication system? So again, uh, we've done the same process for our command and data handling uh, system. Uh, we've outlined three different uh, system objectives. Uh, the first one is to provide autonomy for satellite operations. And this includes execution of time tagged or immediate commands and as uh, also automatically updating uh, the current mode of operation for the satellite. The, the second system objective is to provide te uh, telemetry uh, logging and fault handling, and we wanted we wanted to make sure that we recognize the different severities of both logging and faults 
Um, so we've included this as uh, a feature on the uh, command and data handling system as well. And then the third uh, key system objective is to administer payload passes and uh, provide operation and uh, control of the payload itself. So again, taking these system objectives and mapping them into system requirements. Uh, the first requirement uh, specifies that the spacecraft subsystems uh, shall always be in an appropriate state as defined by the CONOPS, which we'll talk about uh, later on in the, the presentation. Uh, the second uh, key system requirement is that the OBC shall recover from any uh, software latch-ups, whether that's a single event uh, latch-up or upset from uh, dealing with uh, memory accesses. The third system requirement is the OBC shall collect periodically uh, time tagged uh, telemetry packages. And so that connects back to uh, collecting power and ADCS information um, in which we, we store and collect to be downlinked for assessment by uh, ground operators. The uh, fourth requirement is the OBC shall execute time tagged or immediate commands. Uh, and this is a requirement as per the CSTC. Uh, and then the fifth is the OBC shall have all critical configuration files located in non volatile memory. So even in the event of a failure and the OBC does need to restart, anything critical um, shall be remained uh, in non volatile non-volatile memory and can be restored upon reboot. So some of the features that go into our command and data handling system uh, include the subsystem communications and all the interfacing to the entire uh, satellite bus. And this is a, uh, achieved through just various uh, communication protocols, including I2C, uh, TTL, and SBI, depending on uh, which subsystem it's directly interfacing with. Uh, just as well, we have hardware interrupts and inc include request to send and uh, clear to sends um, to facilitate data communication between the various components on the on the satellite bus. And we also include hardware features, including uh, voltage and current monitoring on the board itself, as well as supported by the EPS, uh, flash memory, logging and filing, and then time taking and execution of time taped commands. So putting this into uh, a block diagram, uh, our, the main component of the command and data handling uh, system includes the Raspberry Pi, as you can see on the uh, far side of the screen. But then we wanted to extend the features of the Raspberry Pi um, to include all these additional uh, hardware features. Uh, so we've uh, develop uh, a daughter board um, to to hold all of these hardware components as well and to interface with the rest of the satellite bus and which can be seen on the the left hand side here so a summary of the the hardware used on on board the uh, on board computer includes the the Raspberry Pi 4 as the the main uh, microprocessor um, and this handles all scheduling and runs all scripts uh, or automated scripts uh, for the CONOPS. As well as we have the, the voltage converter, uh, a temperature sensor, and a current monitor. Um, and then these all satisfy um, the precision and accuracy values we need uh, uh, for uh, our collecting our telemetry values. As well as to support our time tagging uh, requirements, we have a real time clock. Um, which the team has previously used in the past uh, and has, I believe, flight heritage as well on some design team uh, missions. And just a additional uh, support uh, for this board includes a crystal oscillator and then a, a micro SD card uh, to hold our, our telemetry data. So moving on to uh, a software architecture, while the team is currently in the midst of developing a more fleshed out uh, class diagram, this is the general structure in which we're uh, tackling the, the software for the, uh, for the satellite. At the top, we have 
uh, uh, a state machine that is in charge of all the operational modes of the satellite. At the, the next tier, we have what we're calling software managers, and they handle all the different events and all the different tasks that go uh, into each one of the events. And these include uh, various managers, such as uh, power managers, a task manager, uh, interrupt manager, and a, a fault and response manager used in, uh, in software. Underneath that are libraries that implement uh, uh, the various functions used in each task, in which uh, they can be described for uh, commands, tasks, as well as passes. And then just below that, we have all the required drivers to uh, interface with the different, uh, different hardware available on the satellite. So one of the, the key uh, software functionalities is handling the, the uplinked commands, whether they are uh, immediate or time tagged. And so this flowchart just brings us through on uh, the process in which a command is, uh, how the OBC handles the command in which it's uh, given to by comms. So at first, uh, a command has an associated command file. And so comms provides just the, the command ID and when OBC uh, receives that command ID, it reads it and then fetches uh, from the. Uh, sorry, and finds the file in memory um, and then uh, determines if it's time tagged or not. If it is time tagged, uh, it initializes a command counter and stores it along with the command file location so that it may retrieve that file back again uh, when it needs to and then compile and execute it. Uh, at the given time. If it's uh, an immediate tag, it compiles and executes it right away, and then uh, and inserts an interrupt for the request to send or clear to send for any given subsystem. And just a brief uh, overview of the programming languages used. So we do have Linux uh, operating system uh, available on the Raspberry Pi, and so that's used um, for scheduling and uh, time tagging, and as well, we have access to, to Python, so that's used for automation in our main scripting, and then C++ for our, all our firmware and, and drivers. Okay, so we'll move on to AI and T. Does anyone have any questions for the command and data handling? Yes. I will pray. So there are like sequences that are going to be running? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're uh, looking. That's one main loop for each cycle of the thing. Yeah, we're looking at a, a few different implementations. One is the, the parallel uh, parallel threads, but then we're also looking into cron jobs available on the uh, Linux operating system. So moving on into assembly integration, integration and testing. Um, we'll just go through each uh, subsystem and give a, an outline of uh, for each subsystem what they're what they're planning on doing. So, so let's start with uh, payload. So for payload, um, the first test here that we'll be uh, running is basic just picture capture. So we need to make sure that our Pi cam is able to get any output at all. Uh, and then once that's been verified, we'll be moving on to image quality. So there's two uh, types of image quality testing we'll be doing. Uh, first is just basic image quality uh, without any external factors. So um, without any, without moving the, the camera at all in ideal conditions, how good of a picture are we able to get out of it? Uh, and then the second will be uh, factoring in um, movement from the satellite, uh, motion blur and so on, vibrations, and seeing if, we're meeting our uh, requirements on uh, attitude determination control, for example, are we still able to get as good of a quality image uh, as we were expecting from the, from the system? And finally, uh, vibration testing. So the, the lens that we're developing, we want to make sure that during launch is still able to um, survive launch and operate normally as we would expect once it's into space. So we'll be running vibration testing on that as well as the, the sensor to make sure that uh, they are operating successfully. For mechanical, um, 
since we're having our chassis manufactured, we need to make sure that all of the dimensions uh, as well as the uh, tolerances meet what we're expecting. So that'll that'll entail various uh, metrology equipment and tests that we'll be running on each part of the, the chassis as it, as it is developed. Um, second, for the mass comparison, we'll start with just the chassis itself. So we need to, again, that the chassis meets all of our, our requirements for our, for our mass budget as we are getting it designed in-house. Uh, and then that will also include uh, incorporating the, the different components from the satellite. Um, so we need to make sure that it not only aligns with our mass budget, but with our CAD model, because we don't want any of our testing that we've done for our uh, thermal uh, vibration, et cetera, testing. We want to make sure that that is still accurate. Finally, we need to make sure that once we're uh, combining the rest of our system together, that we have correct clearance for all of our systems. So this is a basic check for interference between connect components and making sure that our PC-104 connectors are properly connected and uh, that they have enough clearance, basically. Uh, for our power systems, uh, there's again three main tests that we'll be running. So for battery discharge, we need to make sure that they uh, are within all of the characteristics that we expect from, from the batteries. So that's potential, uh, the capacity, um, and DoD. Uh, for the solar pan panels, we'll basically be verifying all of their characteristics. So um, IV curves, um, short circuit current, cutoff voltage, those are the, the main things that we'll be looking at. Um, finally, for the EPS module hardware checkout, uh, this is mostly verifying the voltage rails and simulating overcurrent to make sure that the, the board that we have purchased is behaving as we as we expect. For ADCS, uh, there's four main things that we'll be doing for our uh, integration and testing. So the first is actuator validation, and that's making sure that we're able to get uh, fine control on the reaction wheels and correct, um, correct magnetic fields out of the uh, magnet torquers. For sensor calibration and, and validation, this will involve uh, firstly calibrating the sensors and then second deter determining how accurate they actually are. And so that can involve, for example, for the IMU, um, moving it a set amount and then making sure that it is changing all of its sensor parameters based on that uh, known, known change in uh, attitude. Uh, moving on to uh, overall ADCS testing. So for the simulation, what we'll be looking at is if the control code is behaving as expected and getting us the correct uh, control accuracy. And then we'll also be optimizing design variables. So for example, sampling control frequency, uh, as well as perhaps placement of sensors uh, and so on. And then finally, the last thing for testing for ADCS is the one axis test bed. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the means to do a full three axis physical testing, but we've been developing a one axis test bed that will include uh, at minimum one reaction wheel and one IMU. And this will just be validating the control code on physical hardware, as well as uh, combining the actuator and sensor calibration that we did previously. For communications, um, first the communication test is focusing on the antennas. So this is ensuring that transmitting and receiving are meeting our required 33 dBm and minus 123 dB respective uh, requirements. Um, and then the physical testing for comms would be the antenna deployment testing. So this is making sure that uh, sending a command to the board will properly extend the antennas and that they're staying open and rigid enough uh, for their proper, proper orientation, proper use uh, in flight. Uh, finally, the comms PCB also needs to be tested. So this will involve testing open and short circuits on the PCB once it's back from manufacturing. For OBC, uh, there's again three tests. So first is communication with other subsystems. So this is making sure that uh, all telemetry is being properly communicated between subsystems. All modes of operations are being communicated properly. Uh, and as well that the communication itself is efficient and fast enough to meet all of our requirements. Uh, second, for the OBC daughter board, we need to make sure that it can communicate with the uh, main Raspberry Pi. Um, so that's focusing on uh, read-write for the SD card. Uh, and acquiring data from various other components on the OBC daughter board. Finally, for, for OBC, uh, there's ensuring that it can communicate with communications specifically. So uh, some tasks must be marked as critical. Uh, and for example, we have to have arm and fire uh, passing properly for the OBC. 
uh, communication with the communication system. Um, and finally, that will move us on away from AI and T into some. Oh, I think I've skipped. Sorry, I skipped a slide. Um, let me pause here first uh, if there's any questions on uh, AI and T. Yes. Pardon me? Um, yeah, so I think we sort of covered that already in our um, simulations, but uh, okay. do we want to include more slides on that? Yeah, so for AI and T, um, this is kind of not like that good regarding this presentation, but there was no set requirements, and so we just listed up the top three. We do have plans for thermal simulation. We just didn't show them right here. Okay, I guess I was wondering about like thermal back testing. Uh, so our competition actually includes the back test. Oh, okay. So yeah. that's provided. Oh, okay. That is provided. Yes. yes. Sorry. Do we still want to talk about that? Because they do vibration testing as well. Yeah, they do vibration and feedback. So like are there criteria for pass fail with those tests or? Yeah, I'm wondering if you should now update the yeah. we, one, of, one of the mech ones just to include the Yeah, yeah, we 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 can add that in. Anything else? Yeah. Like, I don't know how specific they want us to be in terms of like how we're actually going to do all these tests. Um, I also miss like the first two bits of so I don't know what I'm um, But it's not totally clear, especially in like the payload section, in terms of actually testing like motion blur and things like that, like how we're going to do that. Um, like, is that right. going to be a simulation or like are we going to try to put it on like a one axis test bed? And like take a picture and see what it looks like. Yeah, we'll 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 be planning on uh, physically testing it. Um, perhaps we can make these slides a bit more clear on that uh, as well for how we're going to do these tests. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I think there are the most of the past fail criteria should be uh, quite numerical. Right. So that's another update. We should do. Okay. Okay, uh, so now we'll move on to a bit more uh, managerial side, the program management. Uh, so to start, uh, we this is our uh, simplified Gantt chart for the rest of the, the project. So we have a much more in-depth Gantt chart that we couldn't fit on these slides. So I uh, just wanna clarify that this is a simplification of the of our, of our schedule. So uh, each of these phases here are our are, are, are entire, Schedule is split up into four phases here. So um, they cover everything from environmental testing, um, CDR, um, flat side integration, and, and so on. So phase A is what we're in right now, and that's electronics uh, manufacturing. So that's um, once we finish CDR, we'll be incorporating feedback um, and making any changes that we need to our designs, um, as well as creating PCB layouts, uh, testing PCB layouts, uh, breadboarding. Um, and creating BOMs and PCB purchases. Uh, phase B will be starting uh, in around January, and that's our flat side integration. So that's taking all of our uh, electronics that we've manufactured and putting it together onto one flat uh, satellite board where we can do testing uh, for communication between each subsystem and just make sure that the whole satellite as a whole is functioning as expected. Uh, and then once that's complete, we will move towards uh, chassis integration. So this will be mounting everything within the chassis, um, mechanical assembly, thermal testing, and vibration testing in-house. And then moving on to phase D, once everything's put together, then we will move on to power testing, sorry, power on testing, uh, fault detection, uh, day in the life, and deployment testing. So between the end of system testing, which is phase D, and the competition, we have left herself a month to um, incorporate any slip that we have during this uh, time frame. Um, and I will also note that uh, these dates that are given for each of these uh, phases here are derived from our uh, critical path, which is basically each phase here has one or more um, components that need to happen in it that determine how long it will be. So that's the, the longest part of each phase, basically. So combined, it gives us about 189 days. 
And the, the highest risk that we have with this current project timeline is uncertainty in uh, team member hours over the course of the next two semesters. Uh, we are students, so it is expected that um, depending on the time of year, people will be more busy with school related activities. So um, that's sort of why we've given ourselves a month at the end to to account for that. So moving on to our budget, um, we've split it up into to two parts. So this here is just the hardware itself. Um, so this is. Sorry. This is an updated table from our uh, preliminary de design review, which we did earlier on in the year, um, and it includes the costs of all spacecraft flight hardware that we are currently designing for. So this includes uh, major components and hardware, um, and it indicates if the costs are actual or estimated. So uh, you can see, for example, that the chassis right now uh, is an estimate, and that's because uh, we're doing our own manufacturing for it, so we can't just look up the, the cost for a, a pre-built chassis. Um, but that being said, um, we have left ourselves margins. So if any of these estimates are higher than we have uh, than we were expecting originally, we've accounted for that in our budgeting uh, as well as you'll see later on. Um, so yes, yeah, so quick quick note is that the the total here is fourteen thousand six hundred dollars Canadian, um, and then if we combine that with our other costs. Um, we will get the full total. So this slide here shows um, any other associated costs that we need to complete the satellite that isn't hardware. Um, the one thing that I will note here is that our ground station hardware is estimated at zero dollars, and this is because we have uh, access to our neighbors, the Royal Military College of Canada, and they will be providing ground station access for us. So the total here um, is nine thousand six hundred dollars. And to accommodate for our costs, we of course have income. So the main two, the first two lines here are estimates that we have for uh, Dean's donation, which is through the Queen's University. Um, they usually are pretty consistent year to year. So uh, we expect that these estimates are fairly accurate. Um, we have already applied for our fall Dean's donation and should be hearing back shortly. And we'll, we'll be applying again in the winter semester. So this totals to about $34,800 Canadian. Um, and then when we combine that with our uh, costs, we see that we are in the black just for raw values. And then if we take into account the margins, which is 15% uh, lower income and 15% higher uh, expenses, then we are still in the black by about $1,700. So moving on, we can get to the risk management. So this is a table that outlines um, the way that we estimated our, our risks. So each risk has a severity calculated by the product of probability and the consequence of it actually happening. Um, and we've labeled each risk with a, an ID, which you can see in the table here, a response plan, a consequence level, and uh, as, as I said, a probability. So the, we split these risks into different categories. So they are defined from scheduling, budgeting, project management, functionality, quality, uh, and personnel as they relate to the satellite project. Um, and we have a complete list of this breakdown in, in an appendix. So from uh, our initial presentation, we, we highlighted three uh, high priority risks. So these are what we presented in the pre pre preliminary design review earlier on this year. Um, and the, our primary concern was identifying potential risks at this time were associated with personnel of the team. Um, so the response method for each of these was mitigation, where we developed a response plan um, revolving mostly around documentation in which the team was successful in, in implementing. So we developed a primer for uh, onboarding and a central, centralized design uh, OneNote, as well as formal documentation for uh, hardware and software for each subsystem. So since then, we have uh, increased the number of risks uh, that we have assessed. So I'm just highlighting our top three right here. So uh, risk 18 is a budget risk. Um, the mitigation for this is basically to provide a uh, safe environment and training in order to handle critical components, uh, including, for example, the Clyde Space Board uh, EPS module and solar panels. Um, ID number 17 is a scheduling risk. 
Um, and the mitigation for this is um, for the risk of hardware circuitry to be simulated and tested on breadboards before we go to manufacturing so that we can um, avoid as much redesigns as possible. Um, and finally, risk 11 is a quality risk. Uh, so the, the mitigation for this is to use previously developed systems as a hardware development platform in order to design, assemble, and test various critical systems. So in summary, um, the weight in here is from low medium risk severity barrier. Sorry, let me let me rephrase that. So currently our weighting of the risk that we have is moving towards the low medium severity barrier, which indicates that we're in good health for the project. Um, functional and quality risks are the principal concerns that we have right now for the team for the remainder of the, the project development. Um, I will also mention that all members who had previous experience with flight hardware have left the team. So this will be the first time that members who are currently on the team will be designing flight hardware. Uh, so this is um, probably the biggest risk uh, in summary of, of the rest of the team. Uh, before we move on to concept of operations, does anyone have any risk, sorry, any questions on <laughs> risk management and the, any other sections that I just covered? Yes. The budget. Um, you mentioned in the black, I think, was like the phrase you used. Yeah. yeah. Does that just mean like operating at a deficit? Uh, no, it means that we're positive numbers. Okay. Yeah. So in, in the red just means we're in the negatives, and in the okay. black means we're the positives. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I have a question about the time. Sure. Um, I was just like, because you have like two weeks listed for flat site integration. Mm -hmm. I was wondering why if there's a reason why like the the different phases maybe don't have a little bit of overlap. Like is the plan to completely finish manufacturing electronics and then start flat site integration? Yeah, completely phases have pretty hard uh, beginning and endings. And so the whole point, yeah. So our plan is to have all the testing of the individual uh, boards be the marker for the end of phase A for electronics manufacturing, and then start into system integration. Okay. My, I just like my concern is that I think two weeks seems like not a lot of time, and I wonder if like I don't know. It's, I wonder if there's like might be concerns about. I guess it's good to have like a month of buffer. Um, but like it seems to me like you almost might want to have like more time for a flat site integration because that's the first time that you'll be putting everything together as a team. Yeah. And yeah. then me like hopefully that's the chance integration will be a little bit like you'll have more practice. Yeah. So it might take a little bit less time. Uh, I, this is I don't know if this is a question that they would ask, but like that's just my like thoughts. Nice. Um, yeah, I didn't realize yeah. it was two weeks. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> my other question about this is it's great that we have a month after this, um, like a buffer, but I know a lot of the people on this team are going to be graduating and will not be living in, in Kingston like during that time. So do we have a plan for like who will be around and like physically able to work on this after April 2022? No. Um, whoever's here and, and will ask to, but that's the trouble of them being volunteering. Yeah, I don't know if they would ask about that, but I just think that's a team that's probably important. And also, phase is still wrong. At the bottom. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> oh, also, yeah. Oh, no. That is a good point as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Nice. Okay. Anything else uh, before we move on? Okay. Thanks. So moving on to the, the CONOPS or uh, concept of operations, uh, these are uh, essentially 
uh, a flow diagram and uh, a basic outline of how the satellite operates uh, while in while in orbit. And so we first start off our operational modes uh, in the LEOP phase or launch and early orbit phase. And then this includes uh, all, uh, all, all stages between launching and nominal operations. So uh, detumbling, uh, sensor calibration, charging our batteries and initializing all our systems. And then we also include uh, a default that includes the pass mode uh, for our nominal operations, as well as uh, two uh, safety uh, uh, safety modes, um, depending on the level of severity of any fault that occurs. First being safe hold, and the second one uh, being survival. And I just want to point out uh, for our concept of operations, for each and every mode, there are only a valid uh, exit conditions in which the satellite may uh, change its operational mode and update its its state machine. Um, and another thing to note uh, for uh, the default and the pass mode, that the pass mode can only be entered into while the satellite is cur uh, currently in the default mode. And this is just to ensure that when we do enter into a pass mode, um, all systems are are ready to, to perform those operations. So di diving deeper into the Leo phase, uh, this phase uh, begins with the the release from the launch vehicle and ends with the the spacecraft in the default mode. Uh, so as you can see, that this mode follows a fairly uh, linear progression that builds the spacecraft uh, closer. Uh, to nominal operations after every successful task. And it begins with um, the release as well as power generation um, and system starts and beginning their initialization sequences. Then it goes into enabling fault tests and fault responses, as well as enabling the generation of uh, various telemetry. Then it goes into magnetic detumbling and then ADCS starts um, determining orbit parameters and getting ready for uh, its first contact um, with ground control. Then it goes into the deployment commands, which is done through a, a two step process called arm and fire. And then once this is successful, it begins transmitting different uh, beacon signals. After that, we go into our calibration phase in which ADCS provides um, or generates calibrated data uh, for its uh, orbital parameters and uh, sensors. And then we go into camera calibration uh, for our payload. Uh, after all of that is done, uh, we recharge our batteries and we are, are ready for our default operations. So this is what our nominal operations look like on board the, the spacecraft. Uh, all tasks are, are handled in a, in a scheduled queue. And all tasks are handled uh, asynchronously and specified by a frequency uh, and a priority. Uh, and so if there is an, any uh, scheduling conflicts, a higher priority task um, will take over. And the task that um, is then discarded uh, is just put back at the top of the queue. Uh, and so high priority tasks are, are those included from uh, the communication system interrupts, as well as fault interrupts that uh, change the operational mode of the satellite. And then additionally, our uh, default schedule that we have on board the satellite include these five different tasks, uh, each responsible for managing the power on, uh, on board the spacecraft, uh, controlling the, the amount of uh, speed and stored momentum that we have on board the spacecraft, uh, sending out those uh, Morse code or, or CW uh, beacon signals, as well as performing calibration on our sensors and our, our camera module, and then undertaking uh, 
the, the pass and uh, performing the payload operations. And then additionally, um, we are hoping to include in software uh, options to update different task parameters uh, and be able to uh, create or remove uh, different tasks as specified once the satellite is in orbit as well. Moving on to the pass mode. Uh, our goal for the pass mode uh, is to keep the nominal operations uh, as simple as possible. Uh, so this made uh, this mode was again made to be a fairly linear process. Uh, if as a note, just if any of the exit conditions for each task uh, are, are not satisfied, um, we want to be able to protect the payload and protect the system at all uh, as much as possible. So if any exit condition isn't met, it just returns to default mode uh, and then which we can assess any faults that occurred. So the pass mode begins, uh, as mentioned before, um, only being able to be entered from the default mode. And then goes into disabling safe hold responses, and it only does the safe hold uh, survival responses uh, are still able to be met, um, but safe hold responses typically only provide um, uh, a period state. It doesn't actually go into anything um, critical uh, for the satellite. The next part uh, includes providing a handshake signal to the amateur radio operators and authenticating the password that is provided as required uh, by the CSTC uh, mission. And then after there is uh, the password uh, being approved, it goes into the full uh, uh, payload sequence. And so this is receiving the selfie command from the amateur radio operator, taking the image right away, compressing the image into our respective file format, and then transmitting that image all in one sequence so that uh, the amateur radio operator um, has that real time point and shoot capability. After that, it enables that safe hold responses that we currently disabled and then returns to, to the default mode. So on the ground, these are the mission control uh, nominal timelines. The first stage of ground operations begins with uh, an email change between the amateur radio operator and mission control. And this is for us to collect requests from all the different uh, amateur radio operators globally. Um, each request gets an associated role angle, a password, and we also determine if there's a scheduling conflict with the current master schedule in which we'll relay that information back to the to the ARO. So then once a communication window is uh, is reached, uh, operations move towards handling initial communication with the satellite. Uh, in this stage, uh, we address any immediate uh, faults that occur in our uh, as we see during our telemetry packages, and we uh, flag them. And the operator uh, uh, looks through and assesses the telemetry package and provides a, a debug sequence and a command to then control the operational mode of the satellite. If all is good, uh, we have active transmission. Up to the up to the spacecraft, in which we have uh, messages that are queued, and acknowledgments are exchanged between the ground and the spacecraft. If there's no messages in the queue, we transition into active reception and listening from the spacecraft, and then this section uh, checks for data integrity and per, uh, performs any uh, retransmission uh, requests to the satellite um, if data is in, uh, illegible uh, during transmission. So going into the safe hold anomalies, uh, each fault has an associated fault type as well as a, a fault response or a, a fault test. And so when a fault is found, 
um, typically through uh, hardware or through interrupts. Um, we determine the fault type and then see if the uh, fault response is enabled. Uh, if yes, we clear the fault test, so we're not constantly getting um, bombarded by interrupt uh, signals. We disable the payload power because we always want to protect uh, the payload and its operations. And then we go into uh, the fault response plan. So for EPS faults, as provided by the EPS, this includes monitoring battery state of charge and overcurrents. And then we also have ADCS faults, um, which we are constantly monitoring uh, the sensor data. And if they deviate away from uh, or drift away from expected values, uh, we limit the amount of control and uh, uh, desaturation that we can pr provide to uh, the ADCS system. We have two identified uh, command and data handling uh, system faults. Uh, the first one is single event upsets, in which we provide just a power cycle uh, to the OBC, as well as uh, a memory overflow, and so which we clear some old and low priority telemetry data. After any and all uh, fault response uh, fault responses, we enable the fault test again. We do a round of uh, collecting telemetry and just wait up here. Uh, a specified amount of delay in which we can then re-enter uh, the fault detection. So survival anomalies uh, operate under the, the same principles, um, but re represent a, a higher consequence on the impact of the spacecraft. So what we've done is for any threshold value uh, for each uh, uh, fault, uh, these are modified to represent more catastrophic conditions, um, but the detection and response plans are, are kept primarily the same. Um, uh, just as a note, we've also included uh, four survival faults, uh, the detection of over and under temperature conditions on the board, uh, on board the spacecraft, and uh, this is implemented by having each one of our hardware boards uh, include a temperature sensor and uh, part of the uh, telemetry package. OK, and that is it for our concept of operations. Is there any questions regarding those? Yes. So remember when you send a command or when you put a command in your queue, yep. right? I'm wondering if there's like a default timeout or if there's a timeout that you can specify. Like, could you get into a situation where, you know, you have fire priority tasks that just like um, are are continually being pushed to the front of the queue and then like a couple minutes later you get like an old command that maybe is no longer appropriate, and, you know, um, tell the telescope to slew somewhere where it or the, the camera to slew somewhere where it shouldn't be or something like that. Yeah, with um, Yeah, how do you handle. Low priority that just keep on getting pushed pushed off to the side. Right. Um, don't know. Um, yeah, good questions. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes for what we do with ballooning payloads is you just have, um, uh, you have like a timeout, right? So basically, if, you know, after so many minutes, uh, you would have to reset the command for, or, or uh, uh, just so that you don't end up executing something. Um, that uh, is, is really, really old. Okay, okay. Yeah, then you increase the priority if you're not going to reset something, to, like make sure it gets done through time, but it has the same thing. Yeah, I guess so. This might be a slightly different case than yours. Sometimes because we would be communicating through like essentially SMS, we just wouldn't get the command for like 10 minutes. It would just show up and then you'd be like, oh no, we didn't want to slow over there. Why is the telescope moving? And it would be right. like the whole so maybe that's not so much of an issue, right. but I do think if you don't have a way of like flushing out or expiring like old tasks, yeah. then then that could lead to a lot of problems later on. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely look into it. Yep. Like the super high level operation modes slide, <clears throat> you have your exit from the past as like a transition to ARO. Yes. Um, just like stop as well. Yeah. 
And then the way I see it is sort of like when you're doing a pass, that's when like you're at a higher risk of stop going farm, but you still have to go through default to get to a safe hold or a survival state. So like, is there any way to like extradite that process if stuff goes wrong from pass to like go through default quickly? Or what is that like process to get from pass into safe hold as opposed to just going through default to safe hold? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yes. So in this photo, yes, it looks, yeah, sorry. Um, any, yes, from pass, you can go to safe hold and survive, or you can go to survival. I, that arrow is missing. Yes, yes. Okay. You can go a couple slides down. How many? Uh, there we go. Um, from fault found after contact, you have two yeses, and it's just unclear why you would go to either one. Are you able to clarify that? Fault found. In there. So you, you go to ID 51 access log tree, and you also go to continue transmission. Uh, yeah, sorry. This arrow goes this way. So this fault found is yes, oh, okay. no, no, but then this is continue transmission. Um, right. Missing no. Yes. Right. So I'll move this arrow to like go. Check yeah, that would be that makes sense. sense. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, I picked that actually a couple places because there's a couple places where you can't really tell which way the arrow is coming. Oh, sh sure. Sure. But even like yeah. Here. Yeah. So they, yeah. So I've done it yeah. there, but I. Where else? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yes, sorry, Jacob. So what it is after is the difference between safe hold and survival. How do you categorize if an event or if an anomaly is a survival event or a safe hold event? So I see it as uh, just various thresholds up. And so, for example, uh, the EPS fault could have, uh, we're monitoring the, the battery state of charge. And so uh, a, a safe hold fault would be a depletion of uh, 60 uh, sixty percent of your depth of discharge. That's when we should be uh, turning off some subsystems and pointing ourselves to the sun, but it's not the end of the world. We're not looking into battery degradation. If we then reach 70%, now that is reaching battery degradation, and now that is uh, impacting the survivability of the satellite. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, just one more about like the safe hold survival. The exit commands on the for those on the high level was the ground station command. Yes. Yes. Why, why is that not like just an internal thing where you read the battery state of charge and then you see that it's good so you can exit back to default? Why does that have to be a ground station? I see it as as an operator of the satellite, you always want to know what's going on with your spacecraft and you want to have full control of that. And so you want to make sure that the problem actually got addressed um, on board the satellite and you give the final go ahead rather than the satellite itself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just to clarify, so do you have it categorized as some issues are safe hold issues versus survival issues? Okay. And then so I can see a situation where a safe hold issue like low power can into other issues because they're way yeah. to categorize like a stacking of issues where they might all individually be safe hold issues, but one causes the next causes the next, and that like the accumulation of those safe hold issues should be triggering triggering a survival mode. Do you have an example? You know, but I'm assuming low power causes a bunch of problems everywhere, sort of thing. If you can't yep. get low power, you can't regulate temperatures, so you have temperature issues. Yeah. Yes, um, I think if you reach the at least one survival mode, uh, like you can still, you can still respond to each one of the survival modes and turn things off periodically and still uh, follow through with each one of these uh, response plans. So yes, you can have all of these faults happening, and you can go through each one, responding to each one. Yeah.
Okay. For most of the way there. So I'll just uh, talk about educational outreach um, uh, right now. So the CSDC puts a, an emphasis on educational outreach to various different age groups. Um, this is in an effort to um, inform people who are younger than us about the possibilities in like careers in the space industry, and also to build more technical knowledge for those of us who are on the design team uh, right now. So the first is for elementary school level uh, age groups. So we participated in the arts and science undergraduate uh, uh, society camp um, in July of this summer. And so this uh, had 64 students, about half and half, um, like, you know, four or five years old versus six, seven, eight years old. Um, and in this opportunity, this uh, outreach event, we just created a, pres a presentation geared towards people, you know, uh, you know, small children, about, you know, the opportunities in, uh, in space science and, uh, and just fun topics related to space. Um, and then after that presentation, we had a hands on event where they could make small uh, water rockets that they could launch uh, in the parking lot. So that was a nice like hands on activity for them to enjoy after a presentation about space science. Um, so that was in July of this year in Kingston. Um, for our secondary school uh, event, uh, that was a week later after the elementary school event. And this was a Queen's Connection engineering summer camp. Um, and so for students 14 to 18 years old, there's about uh, uh, 30 of them present, and we pr uh, introduced uh, you know different careers that can that they can start thinking about in the space uh, industry, um, especially for those students who are you know in grade 11, grade 12, who are looking at potential uh, university uh, programs to apply to, college programs to apply to, that sort of thing, just so that they can have a little bit greater sense of um, what opportunities there are out there in the space community. Um, we also introduced the QSET satellite, so um, and we we just want to show them that design teams are available at universities um, and post-secondary institutions, um, and that there's a lot of valuable information that they can be learned um, from design teams. That was, uh, again, a week after the elementary school event uh, here in Kingston, um, and QSET is continuing our partnership with that summer camp, and so we're providing content for more space-related work, um, and we estimate to reach 200 students uh, over the course of the next year. The next was uh, for university um, age students, so we hold every year in September an info night for our design team. And so we show a high level understanding of both the uh, satellite side of our design team, but also the rover side. So there's a whole other competition that falls under the same uh, design team. So we provide high level information about that. All of our subsystem um, executives come up and discuss their uh, subsystem, how they relate to material that's learned in, in courses. And the main purpose of that event is to recruit new members. Um, so it varies year to year, but generally we see around 50 to 60 Queen students um, and also students from other schools like RMC um, come on down to that event. Um, that's usually mid September, so right around when we're recruiting. Um, and of course, it's on Queen's campus. Uh, our final outreach event is for the general public. So um, this spring, actually, so before the elementary school event, we participated in the science rendezvous uh, here in Kingston. And so this is uh, an opportunity to share um, uh, what we've learned to a variety of different ages. Um, 400 people attended the event. I'm not sure if that's exactly the number that came up to the booth, but that's um, like our, our estimation uh, for that event. Um, and we just promoted um, science in everyday life, um, the role that satellites play in agriculture um, and in the science, um, in, in investigating science. Um, and that was, again, various different age groups. So some people, as you can see, like brought their kids along, uh, and that was also here in Kingston. Um, just to go over the professional organization, which has um, sponsored this event, um, the uh, design team has held a CDR practice presentation uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, to get feedback from, from faculty, um, other members of, of the team, um, and uh, also asked QSET members who are now um, actively working at professional organizations um, so a past team member has attended this event, um, and that's our professional organization. <laughs> Anyhow, um, moving on to the summary of our, of our presentation, we'd like to just go over some very high level ideas that guide us through the process of, um, of ideation and design. Um, that begins with our design philosophy. So we want to be building things um, for the purposes of testability, flexibility, and, uh, and reusability. 
So if there's an instance where we have a, a variety of different designs that we can choose from, we want to be choosing the designs that, first of all, can be tested easily. We want um, to have accurate test results so that we can uh, qualify um, things that we either simulate or do on paper calculations for. We also want things to be flexible. So if we can have one a design that can accomplish multiple different tasks, that's uh, much more advantageous for us than uh, individual um, components. And we also want things to be reusable. Just the nature of a design team is that the year to year changes in um, in executives and um, general members. You need to, to be able to reuse components year to year um, and pass that knowledge down. So those are the three main things that sort of guide our design philosophy. Um, and that will be even more apparent after the CDR presentation when we move to actually building the devices that we're talking about here. I'd like to also outline some major accomplishments. Um, the first being our Space School onboarding program. So Space School is an initiative that our design team has come up with to um, get uh, first years and even upper year students as well onboarded onto the design team. And so in this program, um, students are, are guided through a series of labs um, starting with just uh, you know hooking up an Arduino to a computer and getting an LED to blink, all the way up to making their own um, sort of nano satellite with a few sensors that can be uh, established as a payload. And so that's a really comprehensive program that teaches them a lot of technical skills that would be useful um, when they go, um, if they're interested in joining the space community, let's say in interviews of talking about, um, and also sort of sparking new ideas that students can come then take off and uh, do their own projects with. Um, sort of looking forward to the future, the next few months, uh, and in second semester as well. A major challenge that, that we're going to be facing is designing components, having never designed anything, uh, any flight hardware before. Um, so there's a lot of uh, sort of design rules that we have to take into account with uh, PCB fabrication um, and mechanical mounting to, to the chassis that uh, needs to be taken into account. Um, and um, we, we want to be one step ahead of that, especially when it comes to environmental and vibration testing, uh, because at that point we will see the fruition of, of the work that we're putting in now and hopefully um, uh, creating a, a, a framework to design, let's say, PCBs so that they survive vibration testing will be very important um, coming up. Um, and then also something else that we're looking forward to, uh, not as much design related, but more uh, design team related are technical workshops. So there are a lot of students on our team, a lot of general members that don't necessarily know how to use, uh, uh, let's say, version control techniques like uh, like Git, uploading code to GitHub, doing design reviews, that sort of thing. Um, so we're going to be hosting technical workshops for them to uh, learn about Git, learn about designing PCBs, um, learning about Python, programming languages, all that sort of thing. Um, and so that's uh, something else that we're really looking forward to. So I think that's the end of the presentation. Um, yeah. Um, I think we'll only use supplemental information if it's asked about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what, I guess this is when a lot of questions would be asked, but. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I have a good. question. It's not about what you just talked about, but now that we're at the end, I realize we never talked about like in terms of life cycle plan for the satellite. Is that something that's expected of us to present? Or something, even if it's not expected, we should still talk about that. So I feel like that's something that whenever we talk about space, it's always like a portion we talk about space junk and not like that's a huge issue now. 